it is terrific to be here, and thank you all for waiting since we are late in the day. And we would like to get it rolling with some questions quickly. I'd first like to introduce our panel. First, Mr. Alan Schwartz, Executive Chairman of Guggenheim Partners. Alan. <laughs> Next, Mr. Paul Siegel, Chief Executive Officer of LS Power. Mr. Jeff Johnson, Managing Director in the, the Americas and Sustainable Investing at Temasek. And finally, Mr. Sanjay Sritha, Chief Strategy Officer of Plug Power. Okay, gentlemen, let's sit down and get rolling. I want to set the stage with one number to sort of, we, we talk glibly about doing things more quickly. And we talk glibly often about doing them bigger. But what we're actually faced with and what the people you've been hearing with today and most of you are working on is really a challenge whose scale and magnitude is a lot larger than we sometimes remember, and I want to give this one example. The world's been cooking along for a long time. Every year, shareholders and bankers and investors and pension funds and companies have been putting between one and a half and two trillion dollars a year into keeping our energy supplies flowing. That's the capital expenditure. Let's say two trillion in good years. In order to deal with the Paris pledges which 90% of the world's nations have made, during the decade of the 20s, we will need to average $4 trillion in capital expenses on providing energy. And by the end of the decade, we are likely to be needing to spend $7 trillion. So the whole scale of the global landscape for energy production is going to be changed in the next six or seven years if we have a shot at meeting our Paris obligations. So with that comment, I would then like to ask each of my panelists, beginning with you, what difference has it made to your, country's, your company's ability to move and scale rapidly that the US passed IRA? What difference does IRA make for what you're doing? Go ahead, Thank Alan. You. Yes, I think um, IRA is, is the beginning, and, and I think it was a very good thing to do, and it is a catalyst that is making a lot of people think about how they can really scale investment at a rapid pace, but it is really, as I said, it's not really a big plan, it's a catalyst in, in many senses. Point number one, people want to understand all the components of it. Number two, what about the regulatory and the permitting? Number three, it can't just be the U.S., and I think that's understood. We've got a global economy that has allowed ourselves to have many of the most important raw materials and other things for the economy, as have been talked about for days, in just a couple of countries in the world, and whether or not we'd have access to them to go do the things we want to do is very, very unclear. So hopefully this is leaning in and talking to a number of countries by saying, rather than wait, we needed to get started. And there is a lot of activity going about how to use the IRA to deploy capital. But two things. One, it's got to be global because they've got to be able to figure out how they're going to get their raw materials and everything else and production, you know, reshored. They can't have it all in the same places. So there's going to have to be cooperation, but moving quickly. And two, companies that we're working with that we finance who are looking at IRA projects are already finding as they get further into it that there are certain key components that aren't you know, well thought about that are only in China, for example, and it's not clear if you do an IRA project that China is going to be able to allow you to use their components. So it's a really good start, but there's a lot more that has to be done. Paul, I know you've been doing a lot of expansion and you must have been running into some of these issues. How is IRA affecting your effort to grow your business 
if you're one of the intended beneficiaries of this law, is it benefiting you? I think it will ultimately. I think it's still early. We are, as Alan mentioned, still waiting on a lot of guidance and information yet to come from this city, from DC, and from our, our, our government. Um, clarity on that um, will be helpful. I think fundamentally what the IRA does is it lowers the cost curve across a variety of technologies. It, it makes it cheaper, hopefully more affordable for the ultimate customer. And I think that will ultimately accelerate things. But in the meantime, we are finding some lack of clarity and uh, some supply chain issues are, are rearing their heads that are slowing things down. Jeff, what is, what, how is this playing out for Temasek? What, what, what adjustments, if any, are you making in your vision of where you can go? Yeah, I mean, for, for Temasek, I mean, as a global investor, as you get across geographies and <laughs> segments and asset classes, you know, we really think you know, a lot about putting capital to work where you know, we can you know, earn the returns that we would expect to do. And certainly what IRA has done is provided uh, you know, increasing clarity. I mean, Paul's point's well, well stated. Um, but for us, you know, we look a lot at trying to unpack what it's saying and how to think about which opportunities IRA is going to really accelerate adoption of, so technologies that already work that it can make go faster. Where are the ones that it's going to bridge them in a reasonable time frame to be economic and ultimately investable by some of our kind of core strategies? And then what are some things that are gonna be perhaps supported in the longer term that have less clear business model or economics but are important to be part of the kind of solution space? And so we have strategies and teams and ways we think about investing across all of those. Sanjay, as you guys move forward with green hydrogen, uh, what's your assessment of the importance to the pace of the green hydrogen revolution that's gonna result from IRA? Again, I think uh, we at Plug, as a company focused on building the global green hydrogen ecosystem, obviously, as Paul said, we do need some more clarity, but IRA, in our opinion, is transformational policy support from the federal government. It is one going to make green hydrogen economical versus gray hydrogen in every single application. That's a transformational dynamics in the industry. So you are now the low cost spread. That is correct. Yes, we are. And then what it does for us, right? And we talked about capital formation and you mentioned all the money that we're going to need as a part of this whole energy transition and getting to the Paris Accord and everything else. So Plug was already committing a decent amount of its balance sheet capital to build a lot of these hydrogen plants here in North America. But with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, what that does for us is it really improves the payback of this plant, allows us to recycle the capital. So today we're doing you know 100% equity financing, but down the road, this will allow us to go down the path of potentially 30% equity financing, 20% equity financing, and that $1 allows us to build five plants instead of just building one plant and really get this industry moving much faster. Second question, now, and you talked about the global implications of this. Given that energy security and it can no longer be separated from military security, they're clearly linked in a world at war. How do you think the role of our allies in the developed world, and are we doing, how many of the right things are we doing to actually build the alliances you think we need, and where are we falling short? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really important point. And, and there's several things I want to say quickly that, look, the global economy needs certain things. You know, my generation started with the largest increase in working age population and like in the US was coming into a background of very low savings from a generation of World War II and the Depression. And so we had to find ways to make capital investments and, and get capital cheaper and more available and we did that. We're coming now, the peak of that demographic wave, we're about to face the largest decline in working age population in you know, basically every major economy's history against a background of a massive wave of savings that was built up during that period of time. And so how are we going to redeploy capital in a way that can do what we were able to do in our own countries find the populations that are gonna be growing and consumers of capital, find ways to get that capital in productive ways to them, 
and help that build the global economy. And so it's not as if the economy has to suffer because we have to deal with security or sustainability. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with security. We have to deal with sustainability for the economy, and people are becoming aware of that. But to do it, we've got to get the, the capital to go into the parts of the world that, can, that have population growth, that have areas that they, they can put in the new technologies and deploy them behind some infrastructure build. And I think we've been asleep on that, right? If you look at the latest World Bank report, there's a lack of investment in that part of the world. So I think, as I said, as a catalyst, I think the IRA is now getting people to wake up and say, how do we now work together and figure this out and what's the right balance? And so your question about have we been doing it the right way, I would say no. Are we positioned to potentially start doing it in a much better way? I would say yes. Paul, what, from, from your point of view, what's missing? in the package that's on the table now. What do we really need to go say, okay, this was this was this was a start, but what is what is what do you think we need to add to the mix? I think one of the major issues that, that we have not addressed is is simplifying the permitting process here in the United States. I think we might hear more about that later this afternoon with our speaker. Um, but the the fundamental problem that we're dealing with is that uh, we are seeing in the world of energy opposition from both sides of the political spectrum. Um, both sides of the political spectrum have become well-funded and sophisticated in terms of how to push back on getting anything built. Um, and the reality is here in the U.S., we, we have the benefit of not living in an authoritarian state. We still have processes. The question is how many processes, who adjudicates those, and how do we do that quickly enough that we can push through and begin to deploy those trillions of dollars, Carl, that you mentioned at the in introduction. Jeff, what, it, what do you think, what are the, are the classes of investment that you would have been hesitant about before that you now are more interested in, or vice versa, are there things you might have been eager to invest in before that you think now maybe maybe their time has come and gone? Well, it's interesting. I'd say as at Tomasic, we kind of started this journey on climate and sustainability, you know, well before I joined and got involved. And so this very intentional work to go and kind of embed sustainability in the core of what we do and how do we start to set up platforms and businesses and strategies that fall behind that was um, going back, you know, 10 years or more. More recently, we've certainly started to accelerate that. We've been setting up uh, new platforms and partnerships. You know, well before Ira came in, we set up something called Gen Zero, which is a carbon platform focusing on investing behind technologies and nature-based solutions and things that you have to underwrite to some <coughs> meaningful value on carbon. We set up a joint venture with BlackRock called Decarbonization Partners to do kind of late venture, early growth investing. So, you know, a lot of these things were already underway. We set up a platform in Southeast Asia with HSBC called Pentagreen to help lift up the investments around um, kind of early infrastructure. So when I think about what we're doing here in the, in the U.S., you know, all of this has brought um, obviously some additional competitive advantages to the technologies that are being developed here, which is attractive. It's brought you know, a certain level of certainty that you can start to think about being able to underwrite, which has a lot of value to it. But you know, for us, especially in the growth investing side, we spend a lot of time thinking about where there, where there are technologies that have unit economics that work in markets that are inflecting with great management teams. And if you think about that, you know, what the IRA has done has really helped accelerate a lot of those. And like I said in the, the first question, you know, there's a lot of businesses that work today that'll get better. There's ones that this will help cross the chasm. We really like those. And then the ones that are, you know, longer term, you know, those are some of these other platforms we set up like Gen Zero or some of our early stage investments where we take exposure. So we really try to work across the spectrum. You know, we also have a very large portfolio that we try to kind of deeply decarbonize as well. You know, this isn't about box ticking for us. This is about really kind of problem solving and how do we work with, you know, all the right stakeholders to, to do that. 
Well, Jay, green hydrogen is, I mean, it's sort of a thing that takes one form of energy and delivers it to another place in another form. Sure. It's not really an energy source, it's an energy transmitter. Sure. So I'm a consumer. Why should I care? What's exciting about green hydrogen, assuming that it actually becomes a major part of our energy system? What, what, what am I going to, how, how's my life going to be different if it happens? In a, in a lot of different ways, right? Well, so, um, you know, when you really think about green hydrogen, I think you've got to think about it in a multiple different, um, you know, aspects, if you would. First, as plug, uh, we have deployed a lot of fuel cell system. Today, it is in the material handling industry. And that has helped people actually uh, gain productivity. That have actually helped labor savings. That have actually allowed this warehouses to run better. And during the COVID timing, we moved about 25% of the food and the grocery in the U.S. with our hydrogen fuel cell forklifts. So people got the stuff on time. Productivity was there, right? So that's one application. Second application is then when you start to think about it from the you know, decarbonization perspective in many different industries. Let's take an example where today, as a phase one of our growth, we're building this 500 tons of liquid green hydrogen in North America. That is going to help with our fuel cell application in the material handling industry, fuel cell application to stabilize the grid with our stationary product. But when you really think about decarbonizing the electric grid, decarbonizing the transportation industry, you now have to think about where do I get the right source of that renewable? Going back to your point, right? It's an energy transfer mechanism. You have the lowest possible cost of renewable at a location. You might not have the demand for that electricity or just demand in general in that location. You produce green hydrogen. You move that green hydrogen via pipeline infrastructure, if you would, and then move that hydrogen to a location where you can actually start to use stationary power. So you are now able to think about how the electric grid starts to become even more and more green. You are now starting to think about green hydrogen being economical at parity with diesel, eventually gasoline in multiple different applications where electrification can be done either with battery electric vehicle or with a fuel cell electric vehicle, right? So from a regular consumer's perspective, you are getting a menu of options and you're able to actually get that decarbonization benefit in not just one industry, but in multiple different industries. There's a lot of study. It says hydrogen can be a 20% of the energy mix. It's a massive market, but I think that's probably how it ends up unfolding. Alan, you're talking about a world in which there's an incredible level of collaboration, at least among many nations. And I'm not sure that my readings of the daily newspaper would give me so much confidence that <laughs> I'm in that world. I would like to be in that world. Are we in a new Bretton Woods moment? Do we really need to step back and really rethink our instruments of global cooperation? We, we very, the Bretton Woods moment, you and I both agree, is very, very much uh, relevant, um, you know, Basically, it's necessity is the mother of invention. And you know, a lot of things don't change until you're facing potential crisis, and then all of a sudden that gets you to change. And so a lot of, I think there was a real turning moment, quite frankly, you saw it in all the communities we talk about, and all of these kinds of summits when Russia went into Ukraine. And where basically people had just said, you know, we'll run our, we'll send our capital wherever it wants to go, we'll take it in, don't worry about it. All of a sudden, people saying, well, wh where do all these fertilizers come from? Where do crops come from? What, what happens if we can't get natural gas? Everybody wakes up to that fact that they were overly complacent. And so I'm not saying you snap a fingers and everybody's going to really you know, get together and, and come together. But the need to do it is compelling. And so the incentives behind it are really powerful. And one thing about capital. You know, one of the things I've always said, I did a study one time, you know, capital doesn't require a passport, right? So, but capital does require some rules as to how it can be deployed and earn its return back. So we can get this, and, and one of the things, by the way, and, and when we talk about capital, we talk about investments and everything else. One of the things that I think could be the most powerful incentive on top of IRA is if we could just get a group together and define carbon credits, right? Because the entire corporate community is begging for, for, these, for these credits, right? They're basically going for it. And so if the government sit there and say, we shouldn't just think about what we can put into the system, 
But corporations understand one thing. We have a desperate need for this, and learning curve pricing comes from accelerating volume. So they will give credits to the types of things that Tomasic would invest in or these, these in order to get the acceleration of the cost curves coming down because they're going to need them in a lot better. So it'd be one of the things that would be one of the most simple things to do is unlock the billions of dollars of corporate credits that could come in this market besides government incentives. But you are arguing that people should get, I guess I would call them strategic credits based on the fact that a particular investment accelerated the process of bringing the price down for everything else. It, it really, yes, it will do that, but what it, 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 you don't know what it's gonna do, you just have to know that if, you, if this happens and they put hydrogen here and there's science that says that will reduce the carbon footprint from other things, let's just figure that out, call that a credit, and the money that comes in is just getting a credit for offsetting the carbon that we have or the carbon that we're producing. And that, just like the IRA, gives a subsidy to some of these investments that say, oh, wait a minute, now the cost curve's coming down and debt can come in behind it. Credits would do exactly the same thing. Paul, you, I'm gonna ask you to talk a little bit about the geography of where your company is going. Because I think it's, if you read one set of articles in the newspaper about the politics of clean energy, you would think we had a deep divide along blue versus red, and that clearly all the wind and solar power in the country would be in states that voted for Joe Biden. Uh, you, of course, know that is not true. <laughs> and in fact, you were demonstrating that really even places that thus far haven't really participated heavily in the clean energy revolution are actually quite good places to do so because that's what you're doing as a company. Can you talk about that? Sure. Um, look, so to your point, some of the best renewable resource in this country is in the middle of the country, places that traditionally are not the bluest of, of states. Um, that makes them the lowest cost resources. And the other thing that I, I should have mentioned about the IRA that I fundamentally believe is that it, it is ultimately a job creation program. And as communities begin to see the benefits of bringing jobs, whether those be con our construction, installation jobs, manufacturing jobs, or in my town, finance jobs, um, into the community, becomes really difficult to go back. And that I think might be the biggest ultimate legacy of the IRA is that once we get this train moving, the momentum of it is going to carry us forward and probably uh, going to require future governments to continue to find ways to push that forward. But our, our activities are national, um, we are very focused on keeping the lights on through flexible gas fire generation. We're very focused on building new competitive high voltage transmission. Uh, we're focused on renewables and storage through a business, a standalone business that we spun out recently, and then making a variety of clean energy uh, transition investments um, across the spectrum, including Companies like EVgo in the uh, vehicle electrification space, Sea Power, where we're doing demand response, and a variety of other uh, industries. But the opportunity set is extraordinary, um, and, and and to your point, it's going to many of, of the of the opportunities and factories and jobs are moving to uh, red red states. Can you give us some examples of just, I think, people, where, 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 where you think some of your promising business opportunities lie in the next couple of years? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I think some of the most prominent things to highlight are, are where some of the manufacturers of the equipment that we and the automotive industry use. Let's look at batteries in, as an example. 
There's an enormous industry emerging in places like Ohio, Georgia, Tennessee, Kentucky. Um, billions upon billions of dollars being deployed. Um, and again, I, I think it's going to continue because these are business friendly places that attract capital and attract investment. Jeff, if you, you're looking at the finance side of all this, and if you had the opportunity to sit down with a hypothetical secretary of the treasury and say, look, this is one thing you need to do that would actually make it easier for people like me to identify and make the right investments. What would you, what would you ask the Secretary of Trade? What's what's the biggest thing we haven't done that we should do? Yeah, well, if I uh, stop working at Tomas, like I could say a lot more. <laughs> I okay. would I would say, uh, look, in, in general, um, what Ira has brought is certainty on key things. And you know that certainty is something that you know, we can allocate capital behind, make decisions about, and, and react to. So. Sanjay, in a world in which green hydrogen had been made abundant by companies like yours, what would happen to transportation? Yeah, so um, by the way, Carl, one another point I do want to mention, right, you know, on your prior question about why should, uh, you know, general public care about the green yeah. hydrogen industry. I think uh, this green hydrogen industry as a part of the whole energy transition gives a lot of folks in the traditional energy industry a fantastic soft landing, very similar skill set. It creates a lot of jobs that are very similar from their skill set standpoint, whether they're working in an oil and gas, transmission industry, coal industry, right? So I think that is something we shouldn't overlook. Now, if green hydrogen that we're working on becomes ubiquitous, which is our goal, becomes economical, then I think in the transportation industry, there are other industries that probably gets the adoption much faster, such as refining industry, such as ammonia industry, the existing traditional industrial market where, you know, even in the steel industry, glass manufacturing, semiconductor industry, where you are using about 25,000 tons per day of that gray hydrogen, if green hydrogen is economical, why would you use gray hydrogen, right? It's a natural process of adoption, why it's the right thing to do, and folks will probably do that because it's driven by not just environmental benefit, but also economics. When you think about the transportation industry, it probably evolves in a few phases. First phase probably is something similar to what we're doing in Europe with Renault, light commercial vehicles, where you need to think about fast charging, range, and payload. That is the transportation application where you're probably gonna run into a lot of limitation with a battery electric vehicle, and it probably makes a lot of sense to go down the path of doing fuel cell electric vehicle, right? It's the same electrification at the end of the day. You're driving the electric motor, you get the similar benefit, but you get the additional benefit of payload, range, as well as fast charging. Then after that, I think you probably start to think about class seven and class eight truck market, where you are now talking about much longer distances, right? Battery will probably run into even a bigger challenges from a payload standpoint you know, charge time standpoint. That's another market where if we were to displace class seven and class eight trucks with fuel cell electric vehicle instead of diesel, you're talking about a demand creation of 200,000 tons per day. That's probably the next market you go. And eventually, as you get into 20, 25% kind of a penetration for the battery electric vehicle in the passenger car market, where folks who live in an apartment and might not have access to all the outlet, right, where even the passenger car that needs to stay on the road a long time where you, know, you want to actually make sure that you have a lot more flexibility from that fast fueling and fast range and keep that asset on the road a lot more, that's where I think you start to see the passenger vehicles. So it's, I think, like that second half of this decade, light commercial vehicle, end of this decade, it's probably long haul trucking, and beyond that, you could see a scenario where the passenger car probably would make sense. I'm now going to ask each, there's, this is hard stuff to deal with because we have clearly pushed natural systems well beyond what would have been prudent limits, and we're feeling a lot of pain as a result. And tomorrow morning, we may pick up the newspaper and discover that another place somewhere has been hit by a devastating storm. So I want to ask each of our guests to take about a minute, a minute and a half, to tell you why they are hopeful. What about? The, this moment 
do you think we should be looking to and saying, at least we've got that opportunity we can take advantage of? So Sanjay, you want to begin first? I think, um, again, we all have to, obviously, despite which side of the aisle you're on or what part of the world you live in, the whole climate change is a real issue. Right? I think uh, we today, given what has happened to the renewable electricity cost, cost curve, what has happened to all the capital formation, so there is a menu of options that we actually have now in terms of really finding a proper energy transition here. And I think there is a path for us to get to that Paris Accord goal. But if we don't act now, we all need to, as a team, whether it's an investment side, whether it's even a different company, right, whether it's other consortium, whether it's a global partnership, we have to act now. We don't have time to wait. But the beauty of this is there's a lot of things that are lining up that really allows us to attack this issue head on, but we can't wait. We need to act today, and it is now that we have to make sure that this critical issue is being dealt with, and we just really don't have any time to waste. Jeff, what's hopeful? I'm kind of building off of that, I mean, I think when I look at where we're at, like we need radical collaboration of everybody in this room and everybody else to make this work. And you know, I've worked in startups at big companies and investors started companies, and, and it's just so interesting to look back and say there was a time when the startup community thought it could do everything by itself and you know, knew everything and could just make it happen. And then you had the big companies trying, but typically putting the no in innovation and really struggling to get anything out the other side. And now I think we're seeing over the last 10, 15 years these models of how do you stitch those pieces together? How do you bring more of the ecosystem together, knowing that it's going to take everybody playing their roles to actually see this successful? And, and I think from my perspective, that's what gives me hope is that we've got you know, everybody here collaborating, working together to achieve that. It's, we're far from where we need to be. There's still a lot left to do, but, but that's what I'm hopeful. Paul, what gets you up in the morning smiling? So we've all sat around here and talked about why this is hard and how it's going to take time. But uh, one of the things that gets me motivated and, and excited about where we're going is uh, demographics and specifically, I see that through my kids. Um, I've got three teenagers who are very aware of the existential threats to their future coming through our, our climate and humanity's impacts on the world. And they are motivated, I think their generation is motivated, and with the passage of time, we're gonna have more and more of them and fewer of me. <laughs> and they are uh, very committed to this path. So that gets me um, a great deal of hope. Alan? Yeah, I wanna go back to where you started, because you said it perfectly, we, we have to, uh, in front of us, we have to deploy a massive amount of capital, massive amount more than we've deployed over the last several decades or, or more. And, you know, to get that done, you know, are the components in place? And the components are sitting there in place, i.e., there is a number of technologies, a lot of it on this room and others that we've heard about today, a lot of technologies have emerged that can make a very significant difference. There is also a massive amount of capital that is there to be deployed behind those new technologies. So it's not like we're sitting there saying, we can't do this because there's no way to do it. We don't know how to do hydrogen. We don't know how to do any of these things. The technology's there, and as I said, there's a massive wave of capital besides government that wants to come in. And so the one piece, if, now with the IRA as a catalyst, with certain events in the world waking people up to what they were doing before and how it wasn't working, then I think if you pull that together, the key to get all this done is the regulatory and permitting that was said. The, the, the technology's there, the capital's there. Can we come together and say, let's cut through the red tape and get this deployed and permitted in an aggressive way? And I think a number of companies coming together wanting to, uh, countries coming together wanting to do that has potential. And one last thing I'll say about demographics. While I agree, I'm, I'm inspired by the younger generation, I actually think what we're also seeing is that in the baby boom generation and older, all of a sudden, some of the things that are coming to the front page, they're saying, do I want to really leave that world behind for my grandchildren and my children? 
And so they obviously are motivated because they need to see the world that they can live in. But I think our generation's getting more motivated to say, hey, let's not leave behind the mess that it looks like we've created. Well, I'm going to go back 15 years, which is about when I started tracking projections and forecasts about what was going to happen with climate. And the reason I am hopeful when I get up in the morning is every single one of those forecasts underestimated what human beings were actually going to do to get on top of this problem. It's also true every single one of those forecasts, pretty much, underestimated how much harm we had already done. So we have some repairing to do. It's not just a matter of prevention. We have some repairing to do. But for years, there was a kind of parlor game that climate advocates played every year when the International Energy Agency came out with its forecast of how much solar power there was going to be deployed in the next two years. Frequently, the amount of solar power that IEA forecast that was going to see on the map in two years had already been deployed and exceeded. Now, IEA is now caught up. So that is, I no longer have that parlor game to play. But I think it is important for all of us to recognize what matters is not where we are. What matters is not how fast we're moving. What matters is how fast we are accelerating. But to do that, we have to get ready to embrace far more change than we ever expected. But it can be, if we embrace it, good change. I want to thank you all very much. And you're going to hear some very interesting ideas from the next speaker. And I'm going to conclude and give him the floor. Go this way. That was, that was spectacular.